Section 19 of Astounding Stories 12, December 1930 By Various This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ape Men of Zlotli By David R. Sparks Chapters 6 and 7 Chapter 6 at the end of an hour, Kirby was taking a turn of guard duty at the foot of the steps, while the others remained with Alana in a chamber above. To Kirby, with things thus far along, it seemed that the seizure of the tower had proved a shrewd stroke. It seemed that the tower was to the Duca what Hare was to Samson. From Naida had come the information that the Duca lived hidden within the great shaft of obsidian, and appeared but seldom even before his cacique. Apparently, a large part of his hold upon his subjects was maintained by the mystery with which he kept himself surrounded, and now his retreat was lost to him. Such had been the moral effect of the loss upon both Duca and the cacique, that his whole first hour had gone by without their doing anything. Kirby, standing just around the first turn of the winding stairway, presently cocked his ears to listen to the conclave being held in the amphitheatre. "'Why not starve them out, O Holy One?' he heard one of the cacique ask of the duca, only to be answered by a growl of negation. The duca Kirby had gathered before this wanted to fight. "'But there is no food in the tower, is there?' the cacique still pressed on, and this time he was supported by other voices. "'No,' the duca rumbled back. "'But am I to be deprived of my retreat, left here like a common dog amongst other dogs, while these accursed fiends starve slowly to death?' No, I tell you, you must fight for me. But he had told them so several times before, and nothing had happened. Kirby grinned at the thought of the caste the Duca was losing by being driven to this belittling parley. Holy One, exclaimed a new priest in answer to the urge to fight, what can we do against the golden-haired fiend? The stairs are so narrow that he could defend them alone. And then there are the gates of bronze. If we could shatter the first at the foot of the steps, we should only encounter others. The duca must remember that his tower was built to withstand attack. Even so, the duca snapped back, it must be attacked. I— But then he fell silent, having been made so by the sounds of dissension which arose among his cacique. Kirby, laughing to himself, turned away from his listening post, and tiptoed up the steps. After he had closed and bolted behind him three of the bronze portals so feared by the cacique, he turned to the entrance of the chamber in which he had left Naida and the others. Here all was silent, and he found his friends grouped about a couch on which lay Elana. Feeling the solemnity of the moment, he would have taken his place quietly amongst the mourners. Naida, however, came to him at once, and in a low voice asked for news from the amphitheatre and when Kirby answered that the cacique were unanimously in favor of leaving them alone until they starved, she exclaimed, Oh, then it is good news. After that, however, a shadow of doubt flickered in her great eyes. And yet is it? It means temporary immunity, of course, but starvation. Kirby assured her with a grin. If we had to starve, we might worry, but there is more food here than the duca thinks. Look! From a bulging pocket of his tunic he fished a strip of the roots on which he had subsisted so comfortably. Naida's eyes widened, and several of the girls gave low cries. Yes, Naida exclaimed, but such food! Why, why, do you know what you are offering us? Why, this is the sacred peyote. Only the duca eats it, and at rare intervals his priests. Kirby was really startled now. But surely you and the others have taken quantities of the stuff away from the Valley of the Geyser. Do you mean? Because we gathered the peyote does not mean that we have ever tasted it. We gathered it for the duca. To taste would be complete, utter sacrilege. Have you been eating it? Inwardly Kirby was chuckling at this added proof of the buncumb with which the duca and other ducas had fooled all. Of course I've been eating the peyote. And— "'And nothing has happened to you?' Naida asked. "'Hardly. I certainly haven't been blasted by the lords of the sun and moon, or the serpent, either.' Naida and all the others were silent. The conflict between their reverence for the food and their clear desire to eat it, now that it was become the food of their leader, was pathetic. Kirby put one of the strips in Naida's hand. "'Why not?' he asked. "'We have bested the duca in fair fight. We have seized his tower. 
Why not eat his food? As he had hoped it would, the suggestion at last settled the matter. A moment later, as Naida nibbled her first bite, she smiled. Why, it—it's good. With the question of provisions settled at least for a time, Kirby's next thought was of the tower. The present lull of peace seemed made for exploration. Come along, he said to Naida. We've plenty to do. And then when he explained, they set out, accompanied by Nini, a cousin of Naida's, and Ivana, a younger sister. All of the others remained with little Alana. While they climbed spiral stairs, Naida explained that the chamber they had just left was used by the Duca as a place in which he prayed before and after contacts with cacique or subjects. A sort of halfway station between earth and heaven, as it were, where the Duca might be purged of any sullying influence gained from human relationships. At thought of the rank, egotistical hypocrisy implied by the story, Kirby smiled grimly. Then they came to a new door, heavier than that which barricaded the prayer chamber. Unlocked, the thing swung ponderously at Kirby's push, and with the three girls pressing close beside him he entered, and stopped. Naida, he gasped. Oh, oh, she cried, and while Nini and Ivana gasped, she clapped her hands in an instinctive feminine reaction of joy. But there are things here which I believe none but the Dukas of our race have ever seen. Oh, why, the sacred girdle is as nothing compared to this display. By display she meant a treasure which took Kirby's breath away, which made his heart act queerly. The walls of the chamber were fashioned of polished blocks of obsidian on which stood out in heavy bow-relief a maze of decorative figures fashioned of pure beaten gold, the same kind of gold which had gone into the making of the cylinder of gold. With his first glance at the gorgeously wrought motifs of feathered serpent and sun and moon symbols, Kirby knew to a certainty whence the golden cylinder had come originally. But even the gold, literally tons of it there must have been, was nothing compared to the gems. They were spread out in blinding array upon a great table in the center of the room. There were pearls as big as turkey eggs and whiter, softer than the light of a June morning growing in the east. There were rubies. One amongst the many was the size of a baseball, and glowed like the heart of a red star. The least of the two or three hundred gems would have outclassed the greatest treasures of the crown jewels of England and Russia combined. Most overwhelming of all, however, was the jewel which rested against a square of black cloth all its own in the center of the table, while his heart still acted queerly, while Naida, Nini, and Ivana held back, delighted but still too bewildered to move, Kirby advanced and took gingerly in his hands a single white diamond, about eighteen inches long, and almost as wide and deep as it was long. The thing was carved with exquisite cunning to a likeness of the living head of Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. Kirby dared not guess how many pounds the carven hunk of flashing blue-white carbon weighed. He knew only that, like it, there was no other diamond in the world and that the thing was real. Naida and the two girls were silent now, and suddenly Kirby realized that to their awe of the gem was added awe of deepest religious nature. Slowly he put the diamond head of the serpent back upon its square of cloth. We, we had heard that this thing existed, Naida said presently, voice hushed, but no one except the holy men of our race has ever beheld it. But what is it? Kirby asked. Whence came it? However, when Naida would have answered, he interrupted. But wait. Tell me as we go. We could stay here for the rest of our lives without much trouble, but we've got to cover the rest of the tower and get back to the others. It was after they had closed the door to the treasure room that Naida told him the story. There is not much to tell, she began. The diamond itself is so gorgeous that it is hard to talk about. But here is the story. A great many ages ago one of the dukas of our race found the diamond, decided to carve it into a perfect likeness of the head of the serpent god. All of the craftsmen of the race helped him, and when they were done they took their image to Quetzalcoatl himself, and showed him what they had done. Quetzalcoatl was pleased, so pleased, that he promised all of the wise men that he would cease to prey upon them as he had in the past, and henceforward would take his toll of sacrifice from the ape-men alone. Them he hated, and would continue to hate, because they worshipped not him, but Zlatli. And so it came about, Naida went on slowly, looking up at Kirby as they still mounted wide steps to the upper reaches of the tower, 
that our people gained immunity from a god which had always before harmed and destroyed them. Our race presently began to build this castle here on the high plateau, and Quetzalcoatl kept his compact with them. He still comes out of his chasm at intervals and preys upon the ape-men, but no one of our race has seen him for thousands of years, and he has always let us alone, and there is the whole myth and explanation of why the great diamond is revered among us as a holy of holies. They had mounted to a new door which Kirby guessed might give entrance to the Duca's living quarters, but he was in no mood to open it at once. "'Wait a minute,' he said as they all paused. "'You say that although none of your race has seen Quetzalcoatl since the diamond head was carved, he still comes out of his chasm and makes trouble for the ape-men. Just what does that mean?' "'Why,' Naida looked at him wonderingly, "'I mean what I have said. The serpent comes out of his chasm and—' "'What chasm?' Kirby asked sharply. Why, the one we crossed this morning, it extends to the far reaches of our country, beyond the rural forest, where the ape-men dwell, but which our people never visit. It is in that distant part of the chasm that the serpent dwells. But, but, oh, good Lord, Kirby whistled softly, Naida, do you mean to tell me that Quetzalcoatl was not simply a mythical monster, but an actual living serpent, which is alive, now? Naida and the others shrugged. "'Why not?' she answered. "'Sometimes we have captured a few ape-men, and they tell us stories of how Quetzalcoatl kills them. They say he is very much alive.' But Kirby mumbled in increasing wonder, "'Is this living creature the same which your ancestors worshipped first as long ago, perhaps, as a million years?' "'That,' Naida answered unhesitatingly, "'I'm not sure of. Our cacique believe that the serpent, although it lives no longer than any other sentient thing, finally dies and is succeeded by a new serpent, which is reproduced by itself within its own body. So overwhelming did Kirby find this unexpected sequel to their discovery of the great diamond head, so staggered was he by the fact that Quetzalcoatl, of Aztecan myth, might exist as a sentient creature here in this cavern world, that he had little heart left for exploring other wonders. Nevertheless, he presently pushed open the new door before which they had paused, and behind it found, as he had expected, the Duca's living quarters. These were as severe as the jewel chamber had been gorgeous. A thin pallet spread upon a frame of wood formed the bed, and beside it stood a single stiff chair. That was all. The walls of glistening obsidian were bare. There was, however, a door in one circular wall, and as Kirby flung this open his previous disappointment changed to delight for shelves along the walls of the small chamber held roll after roll of parchment covered with script, and in one corner lay six undamaged, almost new, manlickers and several hundred rounds of ammunition. "'Naida!' he exclaimed. "'Do you know what those are? I suppose that they are weapons of the sort you used against the ape-men this morning?' Kirby grinned. "'They are the same kind I used, and then some. With these weapons we can do what we never could with the smaller one. How did they get here?' They came when I was much younger, Naida answered, with a shade of sadness in her voice. The men who had them penetrated the valley of the geyser, coming by a different route from the one you followed. When the Duca learned they were there, he sent such men of the race as were still able to fight to kill them. That order of the Duca's was one of the first things to turn me against him. The men were not harming us, and they should have been permitted to go away. But the Duca insisted that they be killed, and in the fight were lost eight of our youngest and strongest men. Kirby stooped to inspect the rifles. Has no one learned to use these weapons? No, Naida answered. The Duca kept them for himself. We think, put in Ivana, that he hoped to learn to use them, and was afraid for us to have the knowledge. Kirby filled one of the magazines and felt the heft of the gun with pleasure. "'Very well,' he said. "'It looks to me as though your time to learn the art of shooting has come at last. Come, I think we had better be getting back downstairs.' Kirby took three guns himself, and with the others lugging the rest, they started back. The parchment rolls, he decided, must be left for examination later on. They were all elated when they rejoined the girls in the prayer chamber, and high spirits were still further increased by the report, promptly given, that all had remained quiet in the amphitheatre. Save only for the presence of Alana, radiant and calm in death, the give and take of questions would have been accompanied by actual gaiety. But the time of peace did not last much longer. 
While Naida was in the midst of answering incessant questions about the wonders of the jewel chamber, Kirby heard a sound from below and suddenly went over to the downward winding steps. Listen, he called sharply back to the others. He had not been mistaken. Many footsteps echoed from the amphitheater, and he made out that the cacique were coming toward the bolted gate at the foot of the steps. While he listened, and Naida came eagerly to his side, silence fell. But then clear words came up to them. "'Let the upper world man come to the foot of the steps,' called the duca. "'I have an offer to make him.'" CHAPTER Seven. To himself Kirby chuckled. Such real entreaty filled the duca's voice that there seemed no danger of further treachery from him at the moment. With a grin Kirby took Naida's hand and led her down the steps, unbolting each bronze gate but the last. "'What do you want?' he asked in a cool voice a moment later, when he stopped on the final step and faced the duca from behind the protection of the final gate. Clearly the parley was going to be a blunt one. "'I want you to leave our world,' the duca rumbled promptly. He was drawn up in a posture intended to display dignity, but his left cheek, where Kirby had hammered him, was pulpy and discolored, and somehow he seemed to Kirby more than ever merely human. Under what conditions am I to leave? If you will vacate my tower at once, the duca said with a flush of eagerness which he could not conceal, I will permit Naida and one of my cacique to escort you back to the Valley of the Geyser. I will also give you directions by which you may travel in safety from there to the outer world. Kirby, wanting more details, made himself seem thoughtful. And what would happen to me and to the girls if I decline? Encouraged, the duca made an impressive gesture. You will be left in the tower to die of starvation. Mine is not a complicated offer. It should require no complicated decision. What is your answer? Kirby dropped his carefully assumed mask of thought. My answer is this, he lashed out. I will not leave. The tower is ours, and we will hold it until you have accepted Naida's peace terms on your priestly oath. But if you stay in the tower you will starve, thundered the duca. No, we won't starve. We won't starve because we eat the food of ducas. In silence Kirby took from his pocket a strip of the sacred peyote and bit off one end of it. Suddenly the hush in the amphitheater became complete. As he watched Kirby chewing, the duca gasped and choked. Moreover, Kirby announced with slow emphasis, I have taken possession of the weapons which you took from men of the upper world, and which have already sent men of your race to their death. I have no wish to kill either you or your cacique, but if you do not presently discuss peace with me, you will certainly find yourself embroiled in a struggle more bitter than the mild one of this morning. With that said, he swung on his heel, and taking Naida's hand again, started with her up the steps. I have nothing more to say, he called over his shoulder to a duca whose white-haired majesty had been stripped from him. We're getting on, he whispered to Naida a moment later. The best thing for us is just to sit still now and wait. With the questions he wanted to ask Naida about her world becoming insistent, he found himself as a matter of fact glad for the prospect of further respite. As both of them rejoined the girls in the duca's prayer chamber, the first thing he did was to take from his tunic the cylinder of gold which he had found in the canyon. "'What is this, Naida?' he asked, hoping to start talk that would make all of them forget the duca and politics, and at the same time help him to learn much that he wished to know. But a queer thing happened. Naida's reaction to the carven gold was as unexpected as it was marked. "'Oh!' she cried in a voice which suddenly trembled with surprise, with blank dismay. Somehow the cylinder of gold brought to her face things which not even the serpent's head of the diamond had evoked. The prospect of a long session of talk began to fade out in Kirby's mind. But, Naida, whatever is there about this fragment of gold to startle you as it does? By this time all of the thirty-odd girls had come flocking about them, and all were staring at the cylinder as fascinatedly as Naida. "'Do you see what he has there?' Naida finally asked, ignoring Kirby in her continued excitement. "'Do we see?' answered the girl she had addressed. "'Naida, surely it is the carving which was lost.' Naida was quivering with feeling now. 
Do you realize what it means to our cause, that it should have been returned to us in this way? The girl to whom she had spoken, and the others, simply looked at her, but in one face after another presently dawned awe and joy. Kirby stood still, puzzled, and interested, until at last Naida was recovered enough to speak to him. "'Where did you get this thing which you call a fragment of gold?' she asked, in a hushed voice. "'I found it,' Kirby answered, lying beside the skeleton of an upper-world man, while I was ascending the canyon which brought me to the Valley of the Geyser. "'And you do not know what the cylinder is? But no, of course you could not. What is it, Naida?' Naida glanced at her friends, then laid her hand on Kirby's. Next to the great diamond, it is the most cherished possession of our race. In some respects it is even more holy than the serpent's head. The cylinder happens to be the first work in gold which was ever produced by our people. It was made when the race was new. It was because our first wise men had found they could create things of beauty like this cylinder, that they decided to attempt the creation of the serpent's head which is supposed to have brought all our blessings upon us. Kirby thought he was beginning to understand the excitement which his introduction of the cylinder had created. He also thought he could see what Naida had meant by implying that the cylinder could be made to aid their cause. "'Tell me,' he asked, in a mood approaching reverence, "'how the cylinder came to be lying beside a dead man's bones.' "'It was stolen,' Naida answered in the breathless silence which the others were keeping. When I was very young, an upper-world man found his way here, and the duke had captured and meant to sacrifice him. But while they were leading him to the temple where such special ceremonies are held, the building stands on another plateau beyond this, the man broke away. Some of the priests in the procession were carrying the cylinder, for it was an occasion of great importance. The prisoner knocked them down, got the cylinder away from them, and finally escaped by the same route over which you came. "'And he escaped,' said Kirby wonderingly, "'only to be killed by a rattlesnake before he ever reached the civilized world. "'But do you mean that you never knew your sacred cylinder was so close to you all these years?' "'Naida shook her head. "'We never got to the canyon of which you speak, for a special reason which I shall explain some day. "'And besides that, I think the Duca was afraid of this man who fought so bravely. "'So he counted the cylinder as lost. "'And that is one of the reasons why he killed the men with the rifles,' who appeared in the valley a few years later. Kirby looked at her thoughtfully. The mood for discussing all the wonders of this lower world, which had made him bring out the cylinder originally, had quite vanished. "'I suppose,' he said, "'that anyone who was responsible for the return of the cylinder to its rightful owners would be held in some respect?' Naida nodded vigorously, while little lightnings of excitement flickered in her eyes. "'He might be held in more than respect.' "'What, then, do you suggest that we do next?' Again the small lightnings darted, and Naida reached for the cylinder. "'Do you mind if I take it for a moment?' "'Of course not.' Promptly, then, she faced around. "'Wait here, everyone,' she ordered. And with that she waved the cylinder in a flashing little arc before their eyes and darted to the door. It was also unexpected that she was gone before Kirby could speak. Slowly, with all of the suddenly gay company of the girls following after him, he went to the doorway, and stood on the steps leading to the amphitheater. A minute passed. He heard voices downstairs. He heard Naida's voice ringing clearly, though he could not distinguish her words. He heard a great cry from a score of male throats. More minutes passed. Words that were low and tense poured out in a rumbling volume. Above the rumble, Naida's voice presently sounded again, clear and sweet, but incisive. Then, when no more than five or six minutes had gone, Kirby heard the clang of the bronze gate at the foot of the steps, heard light, swift footsteps ascending. Naida, he called softly. She flashed upward toward him around the last curve in the stairway. Straight to his outstretched arms she went. It is done, it is done, she whispered. Tell us, cried first one girl and then others. Naida drew away from Kirby at last. I told the Duca, she said to all of them, that our leader would keep the cylinder for a period of time equal to one upper world year. If the Duca grants all the terms of peace which we will ask of him, and if he accepts the upper world man as our temporal ruler, and all goes well for a year, then we will consider replacing the cylinder where it belongs. And what, Kirby asked exultantly, does the Duca say? 
Suddenly, without warning, Naida dropped before him on one knee, and from that position gazed up at him, laughing. He says he will make you our king, to govern all temporal affairs within our realm. He is waiting for you to come and hold a conclave now. What? Still kneeling half in fun, half in sincere reverence, Naida held out the precious, potent cylinder of gold. Guard it carefully, she exclaimed, so long as you keep it away from the duca, making him hope to win it back. He will consent to almost anything. Yes, he is waiting with the cacique in the amphitheatre now, waiting to draw up terms of peace. End of chapter 7